A dramatic reading of relativistic rocket science for astrophysics, a blog by the stand-up physicist, available at science2.0.com. Rocket science deserves its reputation as being a difficult uh, subject, subject to approach. Relativistic rocket science is scarier still. If one tries to take this difficult, scary subject and apply it to how the largest masses in all the universe move, wouldn't that be crazy? <laughs> no, this idea is something that could get you certified. And if you don't know the difference between crazy and certified, well, neither did I before my two-week vacation at the Boulder Community Hospital. Uh, that's really a long story and I won't go into it. Newton's law of gravity is broken. It's been broken since 1933. Frank Zwicky was trying to figure out the motions of over a thousand galaxies identified in the coma cluster. The calculations did not go very well. <laughs> he could measure the light and, you know, infer what the weight was from that. And he could measure some velocities. And he put all of that together with the viral theorem, as it's called. And his calculations suggested that he was short by ooh, a factor of 400. He needed 400 times more mass than what he could see with his telescope. Oops! <laughs> the rotation of thin disk galaxies was not actually attempted until the early 1960s. I mean, Newton wouldn't have done it because, well, he didn't know about galaxies. Alar Toumre of MIT did the hard math work using elliptical integrals to figure out the rotation profiles. The calculations did not go well. <laughs> there was enough mass in the galaxies to get the stars moving at that maximum velocity seen, but not enough to keep them going at that speed as the data suggested. Oops! But there was another problem that doesn't get as often um, as mentioned. Uh, if one gave a slight nudge to the galaxy along the axis of rotation, then the galaxy should actually collapse into a little ball. Thin disk galaxies is not stable. Well, that's kind of a problem because you'll have these galaxies go by other galaxies, which is in effect like giving it a bump, and yet the galaxies stay together. So spiral galaxies would really have a, a lot of trouble lasting for billions of years uh, given this instability. Oops! Classical Big Bang Theory is based on a great volume of great data. Everyone is running away from us. <laughs> Those that are near us jog. Those that are farther away still, well, they are actually going at nearly the speed of light. Run it all in reverse, and, well, in the past we'd be closer. So go back further in time, and we'd be getting closer still, and closer, and closer, and closer. Well, there's got to be a limit to this process. And that is what is called the Big Bang. The math basically relies on Newton's law. But two problems emerge. One is called the flatness problem. Gravity is all about acceleration. Go faster, young man, or go slower. <laughs> One stable solution is to go slow and then, like a frightened tortoise, 
Oh, just pull everything back into your shell. Hmm. Forget lasting for like 13 billion years. It would never happen. I mean, so, and that's true if we were just a wee little bit slower. Another stable solution is going too fast. You know, the sprinting hair. This would be so fast that you wouldn't have time to form a galaxy. And we live in one. <laughs> and there's like no stable solution between these two extremes. What we see a flat universe is mathematically an unstable solution. It's like taking a pencil and trying to balance it on a tip here. I got to do that. No, oh, I, I was thinking, should I film this till I get, get it to balance on its head? Uh, I think not. It's already late. All right. So that is a huge problem. The cosmic background radiation is a family photo of those early days. Everyone agreed on the, what velocity to go when leaving the Big Bang party. The horizon problem is that different parts of the universe were space-like separated from each other and thus could not even talk about what speed that speed should be. I mean, and this was an exact agreement, like to five significant digits. When parts of a system are completely and totally independent, reaching a consensus like that is absurd. Oops. Now consider now. Only gravity works on the scale of the entire universe. Gravity is all about attraction. That force of universal love. So, that should mean that as we grow older, well, things uh, slow down, you know, and that's good. I like slowing down. Um, and, you know, logic dictates there's just one choice. Science as a practice demands data. Uh, this is just not too easy data to get. Until the measurement of the Hubble constant was nailed down, I'm not sure if it was even possible. But they did get the data, and the data says we're really not slowing down as we should. We're speeding up a little bit compared to where we should be. Oops! These three problems have three hypotheses which have gained supporters. Dark matter hopes to s supply the stuff needed to make the motion of galaxies work as well as to make things stable. Inflation hopes to find stuff needed to make inflation happen, so all agree on that velocity, as well as make the solution stable. Dark energy hopes to find the stuff that will make us not like each other so much. Dark energy, the movie, would be subtitled The Cosmological Constant Part 2, The Return of Einstein's Biggest Mistake. As a member of the ultra-conservative fringe, I do not feel like I can really comment on any of these hypotheses. I am constrained but what, by what I find in this book, my particle data group, July 2010 particle physics booklet. Now, this has lots and lots of data in it. Um, hey, hey that. Oh my God. <laughs> some of the, some of which I defi uh, I understand, like the mass, electric charge, parity maybe. Okay, I'm pushing my luck. A lot I don't understand. But anyway, um, and the thing is that those uh, people working in the dark arts, as I, I call these uh, hypotheses, um, one, that, one of the things they're saying is it's not in this book. And this is, this is supposed to be a pretty darn complete book, and yet it's not there yet. 
So, I mean, I wish them luck. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I prefer to just work in the light uh, where they can, you know, find me and take me away if, if necessary. So let me define, at least in the context of this blog, a technical speculation. And I will be very technical about my definition of a technical speculation, which is it involves one line of algebra. And it works with one or fewer free parameters. That'd be zero, okay, if you want a hint. A historical example of this would be Balmer's formula of 1885 for the wavelengths of light emitted by hydrogen. He had four pieces of data, and he summarized them as nine-fifths times the number, call it h, uh, four-thirds h, 25 over 21 h, and nine-eighths. H. All of those numerators, the stuff on top, they're squares, but they do not make an increasing series. So find an equivalent set of ratios that are increasing collections of squares. So he figured it was 9 fifths H, 16 twelfths H, 25 twenty-first H, and 36 over 32h. He was a bit of a numberologist here. And that was good because the numerators are now 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, and 6 squared, respectively. But is there a pattern down below? Well, the denominator is always 4 smaller than what is on top. And here is Balmer's one-line technical speculation. Let's say it right. Sweet. Good going guy. Now that was actually uh, generalized by, uh, what was that guy's name, Ryberg? And Bohr's hydrogen model of the atom justifies that formula via quantization of angular momentum. And it actually has no free parameters when Bohr uh, worked his magic. And that is how technical speculations progress from one parameter to none. Modified Newtonian dynamics, or MOND, is a technical speculation. It was proposed in 1983 by M Milgram. The force law of gravity is identical for systems that have a significant amount of acceleration, such as the Earth. It's only when acceleration gets 11 orders of magnitude smaller that Mond transforms into a Newtonian force law like so. Ooh, there we go. So we got an ma squared over a naught, a zero. All right, so there is that one parameter, uh, the a zero, uh, whose measured value is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10 meters per second squared. Well, how well does the napkin work? Well, for thin disk galaxies with flat rotation profiles, it actually works very well. Uh, has worked over a hundred different times, a hundred different galaxies. And that really is impressive. Recent studies with gas-rich galaxies by Stacy Macau have shown a nice match on 47 of 47 such galaxies. The most important message from Mond is that Newton's law of gravity is hardly broken at all. Things are only off for super weeny amounts of gravity. It would take like 
an hour and 15 minutes for anything to fall a millimeter. Mm, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to wait to watch the film of the apple dropping that slowly. The folks marketing dark matter hypothesis promote this issue as the huge missing mass problem. And all that mass is needed to generate a trivial amount of acceleration. Much press on dark matter stresses that it is the only game in town. It is vital to stress the message learned but not embraced by the work on Mond. Newton's law of gravity is hardly broken at all. General Relativity did a similar thing. The wobbling of Mercury was almost completely explained by the other planets. Jupiter, in particular, in box 40.3 of Mr. Thorne and Wheeler. Some 500 arc seconds per century. Now, anything that takes a century to add up, you know, that's just not a big deal. The unexplained part was an order of magnitude smaller per century. That is what general relativity fixed. One needs to be careful in the observations and the calculations uh, to even spot this problem. I'm glad the physicists are this careful. GR does fix the issue. In Subtle is the Lord, the, autobio the autobiography, the biography of Einstein uh, by Pays, he said that Einstein was giddy for three days when he realized that general relativity solved this known problem. Good work, Grandmaster. Hmm, a fine example of fine tuning. By comparison with general relativity, uh, Mond is not pretty. This is one of the reasons it has not prom been promoted too much in the science press. I mean, M.A., you're messing with mother. <laughs> the second law, baby. Oh, that's dangerous stuff. That, uh, so, um, but one, one thing that actually bothers my eye now is that it switches from depending on the mass of the source um, to the square root of that source. What's up with that? Here is actually a bigger problem. Data says Mond is wrong. There is the bullet cluster, a pair of clusters that are actually passing through each other. We can see all the stuff. We can add all that stuff up. We can also measure the speeds and therefore calculate where the gravitational potential is. With the MOND proposal, stuff is stuff. The visual mass and gravitational potential must be exactly aligned. Yet the data says that where we see stuff is not quite where the gravitational potential is. So, folks who work on dark matter then say that they're their only game in town now. Well, there is a problem with that transfer of authority. The replacement of the one parameter MOND technical speculation must be a 1 over R force law. That's what works with a large body of data. I have yet to see why putting stuff in the numerator, as dark matter does, should necessarily lead to a 1 over r law when the accelerations are small, as the data dictates. Real progress would be with a technical speculation that had no free parameters. Certainly dark matter has lots of free freedom, and I, I know people researching are trying to constrain it some. So, Newton's law has both a cause and an effect. I view Mond as really being more on the cause side 
uh, a 1 over r gravity law switchover. What about the effect side of the equation? By the product rule of calculus, we have this little thing, because momentum, after all, is m times v. So the change in mv equals constant m times a change in v, or acceleration, plus constant v times a change in m. So the m, the first term there, that is mother, ma. Very, very familiar. And the second term is the stuff of rocket science. Okay? So, um, so people thought, have actually considered that rocket science term. I've read papers where they carefully thought about, you know, what's going on there. And they say, well, you know, gravity, sorry, galaxies, they don't really throw that much stuff out the window. Uh, and what they do throw out, they don't necessarily throw out that fast. You know, so researchers really concluded that there was no fuel in the galaxy rocket engine. So here is my first guess at a relativistic rocket science law for gravity. I'm going to keep the cause the same. Okay? Oh, I can't view things that way. I'm going to keep the law the, uh, cause the same. And I've got my MA term. And, and for the relativistic swip, uh, twist, I swap the differential distance over the speed of light C for the differential time. Now, the units are all of force. There's no problem with that. I, I showed this to a recent PhD physics um, grad from MIT. Um, he was a friend of mine. Through dancing. Ah, go figure. And uh, he gave it that good, you know, sincere stare. And he said it didn't make any sense to him from a point of view of a vector equation. And I was like, what, that R-hat stuff? <laughs> and then after a few days, I decided it was right. <laughs> Without the right vectors, the above equation is wrong. Good old bullet to the head. Oops. So time to try and make a uh, better speculation. And so this is, uh, this is what I came up with right there. Oh, kind of scary, I know. Well, actually, um, there are a few trivial changes here. One is I put in those zeros uh, to make this uh, a scalar three-vector kind of, or quaternion kind of expression. Um, the zeros do something good, actually. They uh, indicate that this is a conservative law, uh, which is true in the classical domain. And I've also made everything dimensionless since, since uh, nature nurtures naked numbers. Um... And this is a technical speculation with no free parameters. One better than Mond. <laughs> Progresso. Uh, it does not alter Newton's law of gravity in, for any kind of time scale, for any kind of space scale. It does provide gravity a new direction to work in. And that is along the velocity vector. And for every system that does not move, like gravity right here on the Earth, this term is, uh, added term is strictly zero. So Newton got his apple right. Stuff in a galaxy, however, moves. So the relativistic rocket science effect might come into play. Now, when there is like no acceleration going on, the force would depend on an inverse distance. See the snarky puzzle at the end to show this to yourself. With two terms on both sides of the equation, the r hat and the v hat, there's no need for both contributions from Newtonian gravity and the relativistic rocket science term to, to line up exactly. It is formally possible to explain the bullet clustered 
data. But I'm not going to overclaim the cards in my hand. I don't know how to do the calculation involving the bullet cluster. I'm only pointing out as a possibility. What we have here is a new classical constant velocity term that involves gravity. Going back to the classical Big Bang, let's relabel the hor horizon prob uh, problem. All agree on a velocity, the constant velocity problem. Let's relabel the flatness problem, the fine tuning of initial conditions, the stable solution problem. What classical Big Bang theory needs is a stable, constant velocity solution that involves gravity. That is exactly what the relativistic rocket science term could be. What the data from the cosmic background radiation says is that the only factor of gravity to five significant digits was the relativistic rocket science term. All were moving at that constant velocity v. The effect of gravity in the Big Bang is to change where stuff is in space. There is no effect of speeding stuff up or slowing it on down. Now, as the universe has aged, we're seeing some sort of shift between these two terms. Milgram has pointed out um, he of Mon fame, that the expansion ac acceleration that we see is also super weenie, one of those 10 to the minus 10 sorts of things. Now, Balmer does have an advantage on me. All he had to do was to connect four dots, four numbers. He even predicted two more, not knowing they were already known, and he got those right too. I cannot like take computer code for the rotation of a galaxy and just give my technical speculation a try. That code always cancels out the little m on both sides of the equation. Rocket scientists cannot do that. <laughs> Rocket scientists are, however, smart enough to deal with the challenge. And I am not a rocket scientist. I, I have spent time and money trying to understand the data going into the rotation profile of a thin disk galaxy, specifically the galaxy NGC 3198 in Ursa Major. So far, uh, it has been beyond my skill level. I have no idea what numbers would go into the Big Bang calculation or that anomalous acceleration. I am in the deep end of the pool with weights and my gills receded long ago at the early stages of my development. All I have is a new technical speculation. One line of algebra with no adjustable parameters. That is the rarest of birds in the flock of ideas. Relativistic rocket science is both simple and strange. Like a 6-7-10 split in bowling, it has the chance to knock down three dissimilar problems in astrophysics. Galactic motion, the Big Bang, and acceleration, accelerated expansion. Now, this result is not new, at least to me. <laughs> I did a Saturday 8 a.m. presentation at a regional APS meeting in the spring of 2004. I know you weren't there. Actually, no one was there, except the other fringe sorts of folks doing, uh, presenting their own work. Uh, but I have sold buttons um, with the math on them. Uh, and perhaps uh, have even sold, I mean, this is, I'm thinking uh, the uh, global sales now, um, 
I I may have sold three such buttons over six years. <laughs> A small effect indeed. It, it would actually be great if if this technical speculation was true. Because relativistic rocket science must be as difficult as all hell. Physicists should feel no shame at not giving this a try uh, for these three problems. Thank you very much. Oh, that's right. I got a snarky puzzle. So here it goes. Uh, you know, well, you probably should go to the website uh, Science 2.0 to see that equation, okay? Um, and with a bold stroke of the pen, kill Newton. <laughs> Get rid of anything that's got the old R hat. The old familiar, the old stuff, all right? Um, and then I want you to collect uh, the, the DM and the M together. You know, those weird, freaky things on one side, but everybody on the other side, okay? And then uh, take the integral of that. And even if you're many years out of school, that should be the couple that you can do, like polynomials, just shift it down one, that sort of thing. And that's, that's a log, if you forget the dm over m is long, all right? Now, I want you to then take an exponential of both of those. And then I want you to go, okay, what's the Taylor series of this when r is really large, okay? And if you say, well, that's too much for me to do, you can just like go to wolframalpha.com and ask and look at this. It even automatically calculates the series for you. So you just look at the bottom of the page, go, I can read. And ask yourself a simple question. Did I deliver on the 1 over R as I promised? Huh? Ask yourself that. Thank you very much.